former President Donald Trump was indicted today for trying to overturn his loss to Joe Biden. We have to win in November, or we're not going to have Pennsylvania. They'll change the name. They're going to change the name of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvanians have a unique role with democracy and freedom. We have seen Pennsylvanians rise up at the ballot box. The work of making this world resemble one that you would prefer to live in is a lunch pail job. Okay, Dan is back. Let's see if we got Dan for real this time. Can you hear me? Yes, Dan, we can hear you. Awesome. All right. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Is the sound quality okay for my end? Yeah, you're decent. You're decent. Okay. Okay, so I think then we have everybody and we are now streaming live. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining us this evening uh, for a should be an interesting live uh, live podcast roundtable on the very non-controversial topic of masking in schools. Um, unlike, you know, many of the, the arguments have been taking place in Facebook pages and school board meetings all over the state and all over the country, we're going to kind of go beyond the initial question of whether or not masks in school are a good idea. Um, I, I think I speak for everybody on the panel when we say that they are. And this is going to be more about talking about uh, kind of how we got here, how to navigate these situations and where to go from here. Uh, we have a fantastic panel this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce them all briefly. Uh, first, we have Lisa Longo, who has managed and worked on campaigns for candidates from schoolhouse to or from school board to state house, all the way to the White House. In addition to running her own political consulting business, Lisa is also the former president of the Phoenixville Area School Board, served as treasurer of the PA Dems Women's Caucus and the Chester County Democratic Committee. Her focus is now on policy, especially public education, and has also served on the Biden Public education policy committee and was co-author of a white paper on safe school operations during a post pandemic, as well as author of a paper on the hierarchy of decision-making and funding of school districts in the USA. So thank you, Lisa. Um, Dan Grisbeck is running for school board director in Bethel park, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh. He's received his bachelor's in chemical engineering from the university of Pittsburgh and is pursuing his master's in engineering at Purdue currently works at the Naval Nuclear Laboratory as an engineer, ensuring the safe operation and maintenance of nuclear power plants aboard the Nimitz class of aircraft carriers. In his free time, Dan mentors immigrant and refugee students throughout the South Hills Interfaith Movement, volunteers at the Pittsburgh, Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, and serves as a judge at PA Junior Ac Academy of Science competitions. And last but not least, we have Dr. Russell Patterson, who has been an educator for 20 years. He's taught kindergarten, first, third, and fifth grade in a diverse setting. Uh, his leadership skills include working as an assistant principal and currently as a principal. To increase his skills in the area of diversity, he had the opportunity to study the educational systems in Japan and Ghana while working collaborative, collaboratively with the educators in various institutions within these countries. As a principal, Dr. Patterson has worked closely with community partners to bring services that will support the students that he serves. During his tenure as an administrator, his school was recognized by the PA Department of Education as a star school, being regarded, highly regarded for student growth among Pennsylvania schools. He is currently the Democratic nominee for school director in the Pine Rich Richland School District. Dr. Patterson attended the University of Pittsburgh, where he earned a BA, a Master's of Arts in Teaching, and a PhD in Reading Education. He and his wife are the proud, proud parents of three children that are students in Pine Richland School District. So as you can see, we've got some heavy hitters here that are really invested in the subject, and uh, we're, I'm really excited to have everybody. So the first question that I wanted to ask has to do with kind of how we got here, where we have these school boards, uh, you know, being forced to kind of have these individualized battles, uh, you know, in, in local communities. And to me, I, I think, it, it, you know, it obviously all stems from Governor Wolf saying that he did not support a mask mandate. Um, you know, he came out uh, about two weeks ago and said, you know, despite New Jersey, some other states are doing it. His quote is, I think the districts in Pennsylvania have to decide what they want to do. I think the CDC guidelines strongly recommend that schools do that. They're not mandating it, and neither am I. So I want to get some thoughts on that in terms of whether that was a, a prudent move or kind of a passing of the buck. Anybody want to go first? Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. Ladies first. Okay, so um, I think that 
Governor Wolf's statement, I, I look back to the ballot question that was on the, the May primary ballots, where the governor no longer has the ability to put in an emergency order. And I wonder if that's part of the reason why he made the statement he made. But the fact of the matter is, is that the CDC never mandates. The CDC only offers guidance and recommendations. And it is the role of elected officials to codify those recommendations into law or policy. And we have almost always done this. Uh, for example, vaccinations. You must show proof of vaccination to enter most schools for measles, mumps, rubella, polio. Those are all only CDC recommendations. Those are not required. The requirement comes from the Pennsylvania school code. And if you read the, the school code, as I have, it says from time to time, we will update based upon these health guidance statements. Uh, so I don't understand why this one is being treated differently. I wish the state would act. I do wish the Department of Education and the Department of Health at the state level would add this to the list um, that we have to have a mask mandate, because I do believe, especially with the Delta variant, that it's a requirement at this point. It's public health and safety. Russell, what are your thoughts? So, um, first, thank you all for having me. I appreciate being amongst mm -hmm. these esteemed individuals. So thank you all. But um, I mean, I think that it is unfortunate that he didn't make a mandate. However, I mean, you know, school board director, superintendent, um, they're leaders and leaders often have to make tough decisions. Um, and I honestly, you know, I'm just going to speak very candidly. I don't think it was that tough of a decision. Once we get into, once we get into the, um, start thinking about student safety, we anchor ourselves in student safety. It is not a hard decision to make. You know, that, that, that's our priority. I mean, we're not sitting here just making up the saying, oh, we think we want everybody to wear masks. I don't like to wear masks. Um, you know, and I know it, 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 could, it could pose some challenges, but I think when we anchor ourselves in what's in the best interest of the safety of our children, I think it's a, a, a no-brainer. No I think it's just a very easy decision. And I think as a leader, people should sleep well at night knowing that they've made that decision for the safety of the children, leaning on the recommendations of experts. And Russell, in your school where you're running for school board and you're currently principal, is there a mask mandate for the coming year? So there's two different places. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a principal oh, okay. in one district, yep, and I'm running for school board in another district. So there is a mask mandate. I'm going to be honest with you. As a principal, I remember coming out of the pandemic, I was not. I was like, how are we going to get I, I'm in elementary school. I was like, how are we going to get the, these little kids to wear masks? I'm going to be honest. It was really the easiest part of the work. Like, they kind of just, you know, wore the mask. So it was not really an issue. Um, for us at all. like, I, And I was anticipating it being an issue, but it really wasn't. Um, and they just voted um, um, maybe last night, night before last, to have our district where I live, where I'm running for school board, they're, they're, they're putting in place a mass mandate. So, cool. yep. Dan, what about you? Your, your thoughts on this being kind of punted down to the individual districts? Yeah, I, I have the same thoughts as Lisa a little bit. Um, I wasn't entirely sure about what effect the vote in the primary had on most ability to mandate masks. But I guess looking at it more from a conceptual standpoint, it really makes much more sense for that mandate to come down from the state level. Um, just referring to my own district, we had our meeting last night to vote on mandating masks, and they, it was actually a 4-4 vote. Um, one member was uh, not present. She was uh, on a work trip in California and wasn't able to vote. Um, so right now we have no mask mandate. Um, and from their comments, it, it's just abundantly clear to me that a lot of school board directors don't have the background and the scientific knowledge to really make that decision. I mean, we had school board members just blatantly saying masks don't work, citing retracted studies. I mean, there's just a lot right. of misinformation out there. So I think it's tough for local elected officials to make a decision that it's a lot easier for state level officials to make whenever they have the Pennsylvania Department of Health kind of guiding them and giving them the proper information to make that decision. Yeah, and that's interesting that you bring up the State Department of Health because in reading, it looked as though the uh, interim secretary of, of health at the state level was actually, you know, she was asked about a mask mandate and she was kind of like, well, you yeah, know, we'll look at it, whatever. And then like Wolf was like, nope, we're not doing it. So it felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect there 
um, you know, uh, as to how that all came about or, you know, and kind of what the, 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 the thought process was, um, you know, the other thing that kind of struck me was it feels as though the state hasn't really given the school districts any guidance uh, in terms of how to navigate all of this. Um, you know, and, and what you're seeing is a lot of different groups now coming out. Just a couple hours ago, PSEA came out in favor of a full mask mandate statewide. Uh, you know, so you're starting to see different groups saying, "Uh oh, we've got this kind of like leadership vacuum and we better all chime in and, and say what we have to say, um, you know, because otherwise, and I'm sure you've seen it in your districts, I saw it in mine, you know, the, the people that are coming to the school board meetings are the anti-maskers, you know, and they're, they're trying, I, I feel it seems very similar to me, like what we saw with the ACA, if they can show up and be the loudest people in the room and shout everybody down, then they're going to try to have their way. And, you know, I guess the question is, how do you as, you know, professionals who, who have to navigate these waters, how do you deal with these anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers that are just this has become like a crusade for them? You know, they, they've they've made it political. Um, they've made it. You know, they, they've, they've really dug their heels in. How do we navigate that? How do we deal with the, how do we deal with these folks? Uh, Jesse, real quick, I want to jump in there. I think I want to just kind of talk about that PSEA coming in support of. Sure. Um, the mask piece. And that's a critical component that I think is being mm -hmm. left out. So, of course, we want to keep our students safe. Right. Um, and, but we also have people who staff the schools, you know, so right. if you don't have staff, you don't have school, you know. And so they need to be protected. They need their family members to be protected, because if I, my child is sick, I have three children. Two of them were not able to be vaccinated. If one of my children becomes sick, like, I've got to be home with them. And I think everybody's aware there's a massive, highly qualified sub shortage. So that means that when the teachers are gone because they're sick, we have a hard time finding people that can fill their shoes. So, you know, right. no, no staff, no school. So we've got to keep them um, also healthy and well. And that, that's just such a critical piece to this work. Like, I think, um, you know, and I, I think they're um, being left out of the conversation. Yeah, it feels and it feels like the, you know, like I said, they ju I just saw it today, like just two hours ago, they released their press release. And it, it feels like maybe they were a little late to the party, but they're, you know, they are kind of, I think, the, the last big player to weigh in. Um, in terms of having some impact. Now, how far that goes, you know, are, are they going to get to the point where they're going to be willing to, you know, say, we're going to, you know, we're going to pull teachers. We're going to do, I mean, I don't, I, I didn't get the vibe from, from the statement that there was, you know, that heavy of a resistance, but I thought it was really important that they, that, that, that they chimed in and it definitely gives, you know, something, a, a, another powerful voice in the room um, in the arguments. You know. So I, I wanted to pick up on the thread when you said about there's a vacuum of leadership. Has anybody heard anything from the Pennsylvania State Board of Education? Because I haven't heard a word from them the entire pandemic. Where are they? Those are the leaders that would be, you know, helping to craft this. And so I haven't heard from them. And that's that I'm pretty upset about. But also, you know, I'm glad PSEA has come in now because one of the points that I have tried to talk to people who are against masks. They're like, well, my child doesn't need to wear a mask. But they do because of the adults who might be immune, suppressed, faculty, staff, volunteers, grandparents in multi-generational homes. There are all these factors that people aren't aware of. And we need to speak really clearly that, you know, I talked to a mom whose son medically cannot wear a mask. And I said, there are exceptions for that. That's mm -hmm. what everyone else has to be masked. And when I finally, it took us about two hours to get to that point, by the way, going back and forth in this conversation until I finally understood her point. She understood my point. She's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Are you saying my child, because he's medically incapable because of a medical condition, wouldn't have to wear a mask? And I'm I said, that is my understanding. It's written into the rules. So I think it's important that when we come across people who are resistant to the policy, you know, I'm tired of people saying, oh, they're just stupid or they're just ignorant. No, they have different concerns than ours. 
Um, you know, some of the people may be conspiracy theorists, but I think the bulk of the parents, you know, they're being told misinformation, they're believing it. And it is up to us in the public education realm to educate them on the truth and the facts and just state them respectfully. I think it's super important that we do engage and say, you know, we're doing this so we can keep schools open because the other point people have to understand is if we get into a cycle where we have to close down schools and reopen, the cost of that is so overwhelming that we will be in a funding nightmare and we will have to see property tax increases. I mean, there's just so many layers to this problem. It's very complicated. <laughs> it, I'm sorry, Dan, were you going to say something? No, I, I was ready to, but you can go ahead. Okay, so... Well, no, go ahead, because I'm going to move on to something a uh, slightly different point. So go ahead. No, I think the point that Lisa makes is a very good one. And kind of what she's alluding to is I think it's important to remember that no matter what side of this conversation parents are on, their ultimate goal is to have the best possible education and outcomes for their child. They fully believe that that mask is hurting their child, that that mask isn't helping their child, that it's not decreasing the spread of COVID. I genuinely believe that these are things that they believe. And like Lisa said, they're being constantly told in whatever media that they consume that masks don't work. You know, masks can cause a decrease in oxygen and increase in partial pressures of carbon dioxide. I mean, all these things that we know to not be true, but they genuinely believe it's true. So I, I don't think there's really anything that you can do about it besides what Lisa said. I mean, just be respectful, stick to the facts. Uh, one specific thing I think that is beneficial to focus on is the CDC close contact guidance. So basically that states that if a child is within three to six feet of a child who tests positive for COVID, if one of those children didn't have a mask on, um, they would have to quarantine. However, if both children have a mask on, then the child who is exposed no longer has to quarantine. So basically what that's saying is if we all wear masks, if we have a universal mask mandate, your children will stay in school five days a week. If you're not wearing masks, the likelihood of your child having to quarantine, being pulled out for 14 days, having remote instruction, that's greatly increased. And I can tell you, at least in my district, we have no synchronous remote instruction. It's entirely asynchronous. That child is going to be dealt with 14 days of learning loss. Wow. I think, so, um, and Dan, I think Dan, can I just jump in there real quick, Jesse? I'm sorry. Um, please. But yeah, I think, and thank, I appreciate Dan for bringing that up. Um, well, first of all, let me back up. Like I, again, I do not like masks. There are some days I'm offended by my own breath, especially after coffee or something <laughs> like that. Like I, I, I don't like, again, I don't like the mask. I don't like to wear them, but I'm going to do what I need to do. But, um, that whole piece where if they are wearing masks, that does limit or eliminate their, um, their, them having to be quarantined. And that is such an important piece, you know, especially if we're pushing for the five days a week, which I am as a number one, as a parent, a supporter for. I cannot have my kindergarten and second grader back. I can't have them on the computer. I don't want that. Um, but of course, as an <laughs> educator, like we know, I mean, research shows the best instruction is when they're in person, they're live, we can work with them, they can do hands on things, all of those things. I mean, research shows that. So, I mean, that's just, you know, we, we've got to just keep that in our minds that, you know, we want the kids to be in school. Right. I, 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 that, I think that was some of the frustration for me is there's this thought of, oh, well, you're basically trying to sabotage this, you know, to the to the people that want masks. It's like, no, we're we're actually trying to ensure the success of keeping these kids in school. You know, that that's really kind of where this all goes. And but I want to go back to something that Lisa said, because, you know, you, you made it sound a little easier than I think it can be when you're talking about actually talking to folks that are, you know, opposed to this. And I get it. You know, there is massive amounts of frustration. And, yeah, sometimes you just want to be like, yeah, you're stupid. Like, and I get you can't do that and, and it because it's not a fair thing to say. But. What do you do, you know, when you have people and I'll give you a, a, an example that I had, I was speaking at my school board meeting as a parent and I, you know, said, look, you know, masks work. We know that to be true. Um, I, and I said, I know there's a lot of debate back and forth. I said, but what we know is there's 617,000 Americans dead from this disease and people in the audience started to laugh. And I was like, what, what about that was funny in any way, shape or form? And they were like, oh, well, it's funny that you believe that. 
you know, so how do you, I mean, and, and those were the people that were showing up. And, and, you know, the reason that I actually chose to speak was because I wanted to make it clear to the, the board that the people there with the signs and, the, you know, all this stuff, they were, you know, they're, they're in the minority. Um, but but how do you how do you deal with those folks? Yeah, I just, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy because I did say it was a mm-hmm. two hour conversation one on one with a person and, and school board directors. You're in the meeting. You can't do that. Um, I've been on both sides of the table. So before I was elected, I was an activist and I would show up at my school board meetings and speak and uh, sometimes be quite adversarial on on topics that mattered to me, um, especially about the environment. And then once I was elected, you know, there's a different protocol. But I think from a school board director standpoint, when you're in that meeting, you're going to maintain your composure and your professionalism and hopefully be able to do what is best for your district without interference. I mean, we had one district here at Great Valley. The meeting had to be suspended uh, because people were just, you know, so rude and disruptive of the meeting that the board had to adjourn. So I, I'm not sure because if I were at the table, I can only tell you what I would do. And I, I'd like to hear what you know the others on the panel would do, but I would do what Great Valley School District do. I would adjourn the meeting um, and I would return to an online format because if people can't be respectful, then we're going to have to limit their ability to put our elected officials in harm's way. I mean, I have school board directors calling me, telling me they are literally afraid of physical violence and vandalism of their homes and children being bullied. It's horrifying. So no, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy at all. I don't, I didn't mean to say that. I, it was. No, I would say like that, that was wishful thinking on my part. I'm like, damn, it'd, it'd be great if it was that easy. No, it's not. So then what, so then what do we do? You know, that, that's my question. You know, it, it's we could sit here and have a, a a civil conversation back and forth. And I deliberately did not invite any anti-maskers on here because I didn't want that fight. That wasn't the fight, uh, the, the conversation I was looking to have. But in reality, those are the folks out there that are, are making the most noise, that are being splashed all over the news, that are, you know, getting everybody all riled up. How do you get past those people to have that conversation that you need? I can only tell you from a legal perspective, I've I've written two documents that I'm happy to share. And the first one is boards were required to file a health and safety plan. Most of those plans included the phrase follow CDC guidelines. Boards do not have to vote on a mask mandate. If you included that phrase, if you said you were going to follow the CDC, you can simply institute a mask mandate. And that is probably the best way to do it at this point. And any district that doesn't, we are actually reaching out to several different uh, organizations and law firms to see if there's a way to legally get file injunctions against districts that refuse to follow the CDC because they're not following, if it was in their health and safety plan, right? The health and safety plans had to be filed. And then the American Rescue Plan money, which is attached to that, um, you know, is there a way to withhold those funds? I don't know yet, but I hope so. And in that way, we will give school districts the ability to mandate masks without having that huge argument. Okay. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't Please think go, that, um, yeah, I, I think uh, definitely, um, and, you know, I'm trying to navigate this myself, but it's definitely, definitely not the answer to argue. Um, I'm not going to argue <laughs> Um, I think that especially, um, and that's what, and that's what I sound, it's not, it's nothing to argue about because we're relying on experts. I'm not a med, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a medical researcher. So I can, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and go back and forth with you about that. However, what I can say, I know what the CDC is, uh, recommending. I know what the American Pediatric Association is recommending. Until they change that, that's what I, as an educator, I, as a community member, I, as a parent, I'm going to lean on that. I, I can't argue with you about it because I, you know, they read their stuff and argue with them about it. But that's what I'm going to lean on. So it's definitely not something to argue about. Yeah, I think there's really, unfortunately, not a whole lot you can do about those comments. I mean, people have the right to issue their public comment at board meetings, and you know, as a board member, as a citizen of the district, all you can really do is listen to that comment. Um, and if you're not currently on the board, you can do everything you can 
to try to convince your um, school board directors that it is the best choice to mandate masks. I mean, right now, whenever you have, like, like Lisa said, I mean, if you have the health and safety plan up as an agenda item, um, they can comment on that agenda item. Um, there's really no way to stop that. All you can do is make sure that your board chooses the correct policy and mandates masks. And look, and I'm a huge fan of transparency and public comment. When I was the school board president, I added six town hall meetings where we gave people voice on important issues. Everything from homework to start times to school security, budgets. You know, I want the public to come and comment. I'm not suggesting we limit public comment in any way. I've actually had board meetings that I presided over that went till 11 o'clock at night because we wouldn't limit public comment. I also was one of the only board presidents I know. I did away with the three minute limit. I did not limit. If you wanted to come and you had 10 minutes worth, I'm, I was gonna sit there and listen to you. Very rarely did anyone abuse that. Let me just say it's a fiction. Most people don't wanna talk that long, um, but we did insist on civility. I had to cut off one man's mic in, you know, the time I was presiding because he did get rude and disruptive. And I said to him, if you don't stop, I'm going to turn off your mic. And we gave him three warnings. And the third time I shut off his mic. So, I, you know, that's all we can do. But I think it is important that we hear people that everyone, you know, have that ability to come and speak to their elected officials. Yeah. You know, the thing that seemed to frustrate me was it seems to be this idea that it's choice, choice, choice. And the thing that I, the way I fr see it is it, the question isn't the choice as to whether or not the kids should wear masks in school, because by your kid not wearing a mask in school, you've actually made the choice for my kid, right? It, it, that, that's not the choice. The choice should be, you know, and it was funny. I was just talking with my wife about this before I came up to record. She said, you know, we did our bit last year, keeping our kids at home. Now it's time for them. If they feel that strongly about it, they should keep their kids at home. And, and I think that's really been the big frustration. I think why you've seen so many parents and, and educators, you know, teachers get really upset because it's like, look, this is not just about you, how you, your decision impacts me, impacts my kid, impacts my family. And it feels like that seems to be like the, the, the kind of fundamental sticking point that people don't seem to understand. You know, it's not just your decision. And is that, is that something that you've kind of you know, run into in terms of uh, in your uh, discussions with folks? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I think that's the prevailing statement from people that don't want mask mandates is that, well, I'm fine if you wear your mask, but now, you know, you should be okay if I don't want to wear a mask. And, and as you clearly explained, that's not how masks work. I mean, there, there are terms of uh, search control. So, you know, if I don't wear a mask, that obviously harms you. Um, I think that's kind of where the logic of not wanting to accept that masks work kind of come from. Because if someone can say, okay, well, that mask doesn't work, then they can kind of come to the logical conclusion that, well, no, actually, it is personal control because this mask doesn't actually do anything. And, and that's why, kind of like I said earlier, I like to point to the CDC close contact guidance because then I can say, okay, well, if your child does not wear a mask and my child is wearing a mask and your child has COVID, okay, just pretend the mask doesn't work. But by the CDC close contact guidance, my child's going to have to quarantine. So no matter which way you shake it, even if you pretend that masks don't work, your decision to not mask your child is still affecting my child. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm watching in there's a school district out this way uh, in Cumberland County. I think it crosses into Franklin, Shippensburg. They've been in the news lately because at the one meeting where they were voting on their mask mandate, like, you know, everybody was up, like making physical threats and all this. Crap. I mean, like the, the crowd was out of control. And to the credit of the board, they still passed the mandate. And they I guess there was an issue. They had to revote on it for some technical reason or whatever, but they voted still seven to two to reaffirm it. And now the, the, you know, the cry from all the parents is, I don't care. I'm sending my kids to school without a mask anyway. What happens then? I personally would want, I think that's a really interesting question that I've thought about a good amount. Um, it, it is a really tough one. I, I don't think the answer is 
harsh disciplinary punishment. I think that's probably the worst possible thing you could do. I know there have been districts who have floated the idea of detentions, even suspensions, um, if students come to school and don't wear a mask, there's a mask mandate. I think that's entirely the wrong way to go about it. Um, I guess I'm hopeful that having frank conversations with those students uh, away from their parents and saying this is a mask mandate, you need to do this to keep your fellow students safe would be enough. Um, I guess I don't really have a good solution, though, but I don't think the answer is kind of those more extreme measures that take kids out of the classroom. So, Russell, what do you I, think? Yeah, yeah, and so um, I don't, I don't think it's that, um, I don't think it's that challenging. I think it's you apply whatever you would apply to, like if someone violates the dress code or they. I mean, I think, I think we, I don't think we should kind of do anything extra. Like we're saying, as a part of coming into the building, you have to wear a mask. You know, whatever some dress codes are, undergarments can't be exposed or, you know, all of these things. And so whatever measures that particular school or that district has in place, I think it's still applicable to something like a mask mandate. Um, I don't think we should overthink it. I don't think, you know, don't give it a whole lot of weight and make it such a big deal. I think it should be looked at that same way. <laughs> But I guess you're right, and I agree with you to some extent, but my my question is, it's a little different because if someone violates the dress code, right, they can sit in the office until their parents come and get them, right, or, or whatever, uh, bring a sweatshirt, what, you know, whatever it might be. But this is a little different because if we're talking about it from a public health point of view, you know, by taking these kids that aren't masked, do we just put, you know, do they get to go in the classroom and do, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, a, you know, or when their parents come to get them and, you know, they're not going to be wearing a mask, right? Because that, it, that that's, it feels like some of these folks are just spoiling for that fight, right? They're going to make it difficult. Whereas your kid violated the dress code. Okay, we'll come deal with it. You may disagree or whatever. But this feels like it's going to be, you know, they're going to come in, phones recording, you know, ready to roll, looking for an argument. And, you know, I, I think it puts schools, the administrators and the staff in an incredibly difficult position um, to have to, you know, by necessity, police that because you can't just look the other way and be like, OK, go back into class because now you've just upset the entire apple cart of saying, you know, you've now theoretically exposed those kids to a risk that they shouldn't have been exposed to. No, I agree. It has to be like dress code. If, if you show up at a school with a mask mandate and you don't have a mask, you don't enter the building. I mean, if you're on a bus, you have to have the mask on, so they shouldn't even be able to get on the bus without a mask. I agree, Jesse. Some parents are going to show up, but I think that'll be a small fraction. What concerns me more, and you might want to put me off on this topic, but I think that this is being done purposefully. I think that this is a tactic that the GOP is using to destabilize public education. Because on the one hand, we have parents saying, well, if you mandate masks, I'm going to pull my kid and put them in a charter school or homeschool. You have parents saying, if you don't mandate masks, I'm going to pull my kid and put them into a charter school or a private school or homeschool. And the problem we're having is there's not a single online private charter, right? There's a difference between a true nonprofit public charter and these ones that are managed by education management for-profit companies. And I'm speaking specifically to those online charters. Not one has met annual yearly progress ever in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, they're garbage. So we're giving our money to schools that are not meeting basic education standards. We have a Republican-controlled legislature. And look, people say you make it political. Nope, I'm just pointing out the facts. The Republican-controlled legislature will not pass charter school reform. This is a way of defunding public schools. And that is my concern. And because this mask issue is not the real issue, but it's a way of getting to the teacher's pension fund. It's a way of getting to property taxes. Because when people start to understand, property taxes go directly from your house to your school. There's no way for them to launder that money into earnings per share for their corporate donors, right? So that's my thing is they're doing this, you know, the pandemic was an opportunity for this to happen, right? So they saw it and the side that wants to privatize schools is jumping on that opportunity to say, hey, we can create this 
whole circus and we can create all this emotional distress in parents and convince them to remove their student from public school. 90% of the students in the United States currently are in public schools and democracy in America is built on public education and free public education. So destabilizing schools, I believe, destabilizes our democratic process. You know, I will say one thing to that is at the school board meeting I went to, you know, and Lisa, you know a little bit about my background. You know, I know what astroturfing looks like, right? I know when everybody kind of, you know, when the I know when there's a plan and being, you know, being executed in, in front of a, a meeting. And I definitely got that vibe um, with the with the folks that were getting up and speaking at my school board meeting. It was interesting. Two of the first four speakers did not have kids in the district. And I'm thinking, why are you even you shouldn't even be allowed to speak. Right. I mean, you know, and but it, and it felt like there was everybody had their role to play. There was, you know, that I work for 3M and this and this. And let me tell you why masks are bad. And I do this. And let me tell you why it, it felt like a school play, you know, um, not to say every parent there was like that, because there were some people that, you know, you could tell were kind of just there. But there was a core group of people that I felt like this is what they do. They're going from school district to school district to school district. And they're making these same arguments. And. Yeah, so I definitely get that there was I, I definitely did feel that there was a uh, something a little nefarious at play. I don't know if it's as, uh, you know, well thought out as you, as you described, um, at least at that level. But it definitely did feel like there was an element of kind of astroturfing going on there. Um, and, and, and it makes it. Yeah, you know, but but again, then what do you do? You, you know, when you try to call that out, then, you know, oh, how dare you? And it, you know, it turns into a whole other thing. Um, but. I guess, well, let me, let's take a step back then and, and look a little bit into the future. What do you think the political implications will be for this fight, right? Whether, you know, some schools are going to have mandates, some aren't, some are going to, you know, some are going to end up closing, some are going to stay open. It's, you know, it's going to be a mixed bag, um, most likely. Do you think, you know, as we look forward to like the governor's race and we look you know, down the line, I mean, do you think this is going to be used as a political football? I, I do. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> no, you go. That's all I wanted to say. I do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the intention, but I think it's backfiring. Um, I can't remember who the pollster was, but a, a recent poll looking at bans on mask mandates. Um, I believe it was something like 62% of people were against bans on mask mandates and like 38% were for. So I don't think it's a winning message for the Republican Party. I know lots of Republicans in my school district that are for mask mandates. They say it's not a big deal. Yes, it's just a piece of cloth. It's really not consequential. I mean, we can see data that it works and it's going to keep kids in the classroom. So, yeah, by all means, mandate masks. I mean, it is a and like you said, there's a lot of people that come to the board meetings. Um, I, I wouldn't call it as much, you know, astroturfing, at least in our district, because it, it definitely is a lot of parents um, of students in the district. There are a lot of people that don't have kids as well. Um, but it's a very small sect of the population that is really passionate against these mask mandates. And I think it's just not a winning message for the Republican Party. I, I think a bigger, I, I guess, astroturfing um, by the Republican Party is definitely the CRT messaging. And I think that's probably a lot more effective um, for them. Polling is a lot more in their favor in that end. So if they want to make, you know, mass mandates the hill they die on, by all means, I'm, I'm very for that. And for some of them, it may literally, literally be the hill they die on. But the you're right. And, and CRT is definitely I feel like they were like all geared up for CRT. And they're like, oh, wait, let's do this mask thing first. And then we'll come back to CRT. Cause it's going to be there. Um, you know, that, that, that's a whole other, it's, yeah, that's a whole other podcast unto itself. Yeah, let, um, me know, let me know when you do that podcast, Jesse. I will, I will, podcast, because, please, please. I, and because I, I definitely, it's going to be more than one because, you know, you look at how many, we'll, we'll take a little side tour here. Look at how many people lost or got beat up in down ticket races in 2020 on defund the police and BLM. And, you know, it clearly to some extent worked for Republicans, you know, in, in down ticket races, CRT is going to be like that on steroids, right? So it's because of those 2020 down ballot losses that they're taking CRT and they're using it because if we start to teach more um, equity based teaching methods, because look in elementary and I'm going to let, you know, Dr. Patterson speak to it more, but 
what we were doing here in Phoenixville is we're going to not only trauma-informed education, but equity-based education, because the achievement gap is one of the largest cost drivers in public education. And if we use equity as a foundation, you can reduce your achievement gap, you can reduce your cost. They're conflating that with CRT because they saw that that kind of inflammatory, you know, nonsense messaging worked for them. And, and it disturbed the vote. You know, it literally created a ripple in the force. I always tell people if they wanted, I said, I'll talk with you about CRT if you could explain to me what it is. And more often than not, that's pretty much the end of the discussion. Um, but yeah, that, that, yeah we'll, we'll come back and talk about that one another day because that is definitely a, a, a podcast unto itself. Another thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, as this is kind of evolving now, you know, so, for example, in my school district, the board came back with a safety plan that said optional masking. But if the state does mandate, we will follow that mandate. And, you know, so like everybody was happy and nobody was happy as we left. And but it felt it felt fairly well reasoned. I was very impressed with our superintendent. You know, some of the board members get very uh, there's an anesthesiologist on our board, give a very well reasoned, you know, thought process and everything. But immediately then the debate shifted to exemptions. And it was, you know, well, we want a religious or a philosophical exemption. And to me, I think that's insanity because it totally undoes the entire point. And I'm seeing now there are districts across the country that are they're pressuring their school boards to change the exemption from a doctor signature to a parent signature. And that's happening in like Kansas and some other places. But you know how this stuff works. It, you know, it catches on and it'll start to be the thing. You know, how do you think, what are your thoughts on, on the exemption issue and, and how we navigate that? But um, Jesse, you said, so the district, your district decided not to make mask optional. No, they decided okay. to make them optional, not mandatory. Not so. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I can be honest with you. I have a problem with that. And my problem with that is I think the caveat in any situation should be the children who are under 12. So that means you have <laughs> elements so as an elementary person. You have buildings filled with students that were not able, you know, 100 percent of that population had no option to be vaccinated. To me, that makes no sense. And I think that that's that's problematic for me. I, I, now, I can give it to a district that will say, you know what, if your child is 12 and over, we're going to go to school and they have that option. Even I mean, it's somewhat questionable with the Delta variant, but I can sleep at night a little bit. But when we talk about that 11 and under crew and we're saying that it's you know, optional for them and none of them have had, like, we're just, we're just waiting for it to run rampant amongst the students, the teachers. I th I th that is, that's problematic for me. Yeah, my kids are six and seven going into kindergarten, first grade. So yeah, I'm right there. And that was my whole point was, Hey, tw you know, cause that, and that was my, the one response I was able to give that could kind of shut the room up, you know, choice, choice, choice. My kids don't have a choice. They're the only ones that don't have a choice in this. They're under 12. They cannot be vaccinated yet. So that, you know, you know, that, that, that you're right. It's a huge part of it. But so don't forget, don't forget that then there's the staff. So in the staff, right. you know, they have little children at home, possibly. Some of them are taking care of their parents, you know. And so it just jeopardizes a whole community of people. And I, I can't. No, that that's it's a problem for me when I hear that they're just making an option for the entire district. Yeah, well, it was interesting. So we did a uh, we just got an email from the superintendent today saying that they're taking everything under consideration and they're going to be making some announcements or clarifications or whatever, because they started a petition out here. I think we got like 700 signatures in like no time, um, you know, to, to go to mandatory masking. But at that school board meeting, it was like. Uh, 85% of the people there that spoke on the record were anti-mask, you know, and, and that, so the, there wasn't a lot of pressure placed the other way on the board. I mean, I wrote an email myself in advance that put a little pressure, but it wasn't, uh, you know, and the thing that, that bothered me, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is that in kind of mollifying or kind of trying to bring everybody together, because in, in our district, you know, I've only lived it for two years, but 
uh, and it's regarded as a very good school district, the McCansburg School District. But everybody was fairly well behaved. There weren't shenanigans. There weren't yelling and screaming. There wasn't any of that stuff. It was it was pretty well managed. But there was this idea of, well, it's great that we have both sides and both sides could be civil. And, and I'm thinking to myself, but are there really both sides? Are we kind of like, aren't we kind of giving a little more credibility to this anti-science perspective by saying it's like it's two equal sides? So I, I think listening doesn't give it equal weight, at least in my mind. And I, and I don't think mm -hmm. it does in the mind of others. As an elected official, you have to listen. Sure. But at the end of the day, the vote is your personal conscience. There were many votes where I had to speak and say, I want to explain why I'm going to vote. Even though I heard everything you all said, this is still the right thing for the children. I always explained that there were three points of decision that I looked at when I had to vote on anything. How did it impact my students? How did it impact my staff and faculty? And how did it impact my taxpayers and community? And it was in that order. So if the first point for me was this would harm my students, it was a simple decision. And I think for this, this is the same thing. We're going to see school boards and superintendents make a decision, even if it's against public opinion. We have three teachers, and I understand, sadly, a fourth just died in Florida from COVID since they've returned. Florida. I mean, we're seeing uh, school boards in Texas defying the governor's, you know, anti-mask right. order. Into putting it into the dress code to get around his, you know, ridiculous attempt to not allow masks. So I think it comes down to conscience. And this is not a political thing. There are many good, conscientious Republican board members mm -hmm. who want to protect their children, their staff, their faculty. They are going to do the right thing, I believe, at the end of the day, even if they personally may not want to wear a mask. It's not about them either. It's about the children and the adults in those buildings. Right, so I think it's a really, you know, from our standpoint, it's a really clear decision, right? Like it's a slam dunk, masks are not a big deal. They prevent the spread of COVID. They're gonna keep kids in the classroom. But I mean, clearly your board doesn't feel that way because you said your board left masks optional, right? They're not being mandated. Right. So I, I think we have to remember that, you know, other people are coming at this from a completely different mindset than we are. It, it, to me, I mean, you know, I my job is mainly interpreting data and making um, engineering-based decisions, and I look at the available data, and I'm like, well, this is obvious. I mean, I, I'm also a, a mentor um, for immigrant and refugee children that mostly don't speak English as their first language. So if there's going to be any group of kids who are affected by masks, who have trouble communicating, have trouble connecting, it's probably going to be those groups of kids whose English maybe isn't as good as other students are. Again, no impact whatsoever. So from my standpoint, this is so clear. But again, from other people's standpoint, it clearly isn't. It clearly, there is a legitimate argument in their mind. I, and I, I, I also just to, just to jump in there too. Um, you know, as a principal, you know, a parent, um, I don't take when parents drop their children off at school. I am the caretaker. My staff, we are the caretakers. Um, and I don't take I don't take that lightly at all. So in any type of decision, I'm always going to err on the side of caution, like even to the point of, oh, why? That's that's a lot. I take care of people's children. That's part of what I do for a living. So at the end of the day, if somebody said, you know what, we had to fire Dr. Patterson because he was following the CDC mandate. I'm OK with that. If that's the reason, if that's the reason I got to go, I'm saying right. peace, you know, and I can and I'm OK with that. He wanted to make sure the children, he felt like this was what needed to make, you know, keep the children safe. Like, I don't take it like, that's why, that's why for me, and I know maybe different for a lot, it's like really black and white. Like, it's not, this is what the experts are saying. These are what the, it, this is the decision we have to make. And this is, is what it is. Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that about being the caretaker, because, you know, at, at the meeting I was at, you know, that was one of the big things that came up was, a lot of the anti-maskers were saying it's not your job to to uh, protect my kids' health, and I'm like, what, what the hell? Like, but they were all screaming how much they wanted their kids back in school just six or seven months ago, right? And because then it was the job of the teachers and the administrators to take care of their kids while they go to work. It's it's they want it both ways, and and that's not the way a 
a civil society works. You know, in a civil society, we work for the common good and we have to do what's best for the greatest and putting our children at risk. Look, the biggest thing that I talk to parents about who are anti-mask right now is the long-term impacts of COVID. We don't know them. I know some adults who have had COVID and they're, they're still having and feeling impacts. And we don't know what that might do to our children. Why would you want to, you know, put your child where they could have a long-term illness? And again, that's an argument that does seem to get through to these, you know, people who are anti-mask. And they're like, oh, wait, 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 I wasn't quite sure about that. And if I send them more info and you can, you know, talk through that. And I always explain, I'm not trying to tell you how to raise your child. That's not what this is about, but it is how we're going to behave while we're in school. That is the job of Dr. Patterson or the school board, you know, setting policy. But the, the administrators, you know, they're the CEO of that building. That's how I look at it. So they absolutely get to, you know, oversee and make those rules. But then, then there's the other piece, I think, where um, I'm hearing like some schools may make the children bring, bring their own mask and do. And then, you know, if the kid, then that's all. It, no, so as the school, let me tell you, I'm going to make it as easy. I'm going to have all kinds of masks, different sizes. I may even try to get some colors in there. Um, some of the kids will tell you, I don't like the way my breath smells. All right, I got mints and gum and things like that for them. I'm going to keep hands. Hand. You know, you just want to, as the school, we don't want to be a part. Look, we're just trying, like, we're not trying to battle with anybody. You know, I, I don't like this. Color. Okay, well, maybe I might have a red one or something in my heart. You like red? What color do you like? You know, so we have to also, you know, not position ourselves so adversarial. You have to make sure we just pivot, like work with them. See what the, you know, listen to what the children are saying. Oh, you know, every day it's hard for me to breathe. Okay. Do, do you need like a little, like, do we need to give you a two minute break? Do you need to go to the bathroom when no one's in? I don't know. Like figure something out, but just, you, you, we can't battle. Let's not battle over this, you know, and um, that, that's too much. So and it's fun. To, I'm sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Just on that needing a break, part of the CDC guidelines, the mitigation strategies are much more than masks. This has become all about masks, but another part of the mitigation strategy is cycling the children outside regularly because fresh air and soap and water are two of the best uh, defenses we have against COVID. Masks are next. So elementary school children, you know, washing hands regularly, whether that be, you know, every hour on the hour or whatever works in your school setting, but also every 90 minutes. I think was what I had read somewhere. Um, I don't know if that was the American Academy of Pediatrics or the CDC. I read so many of these guidelines, but regularly getting the kids outside in fresh air and giving them that opportunity now, because right now with, if you're in low transmission, you don't need masks outside. So get them outside and look, 20 minutes of sunshine a day has been shown to also alleviate stress and anxiety. So when we're talking about these kids are more stressed out because of all this, we'll get them outside playing and, and that's going to help as well. You just segued into something that I wanted to talk about, which was the impact on kids. And one of the arguments that you hear is, uh, you know, against masking and, and all this stuff is, you know, uh, and, and also as a, a co-argument, like you said, of kind of like trying to have it both ways as to why we need to be back in person is because of the mental health impact on children. And I'm in no way trying to minimize that. I, I, I luckily, you know, my kids were young enough and they have siblings, you know, they're they're 14 months apart. I didn't have to we didn't have to live that piece of it, but I get it. And there's no doubt about it. It was interesting. You know, we had one girl, uh, maybe I think she was 16, 17. There was one student showed up at the school board meeting to talk and she talked about the being spit on for wearing a mask last year, for being mocked, for having teachers openly call COVID a hoax in front of other kids. And it was interesting because she looked at the parents and said, where's that grace that you've been asking for? Right. You know, where where is it? And that's one of the things that I worry about is by having masks optional in schools. You know, my kids are going to wear a mask. Well, you know, other kids aren't going to be wearing masks. Are we not taking that argument kind of into the classroom where it kind of the last place we want it to be? You know, about, you know, who, you know, why kids are wearing masks and why aren't. Well, my mommy says masks are stupid. And, you know, like, I mean, I could, is that a realistic concern? I mean, to me, it think, I feels like it might be. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I know one parent whose kid was already bullied because he went to football practice and he had his mask on because they were doing paddleless drills. And, you know, a, another kid was making fun of him, telling him to turn, take his mask off. So, I mean, I think that's definitely going to be an issue. I think kind of like Dr. Patterson and Lisa both said, we want to make this as easy as possible for kids because, and like you alluded to, they're bringing in what their parents say with them. So they might not actually have a problem with masks, but if every day their parents are telling them how masks are ridiculous, they shouldn't be wearing them, you've kind of got a battle to fight there. You want to make this as easy for the kids as possible. Um, you want to give them options, like Dr. Patterson said, different masks. If they don't like a certain type, they can wear this type instead because you are going to have those issues. If it's optional and most kids aren't wearing them, you're going to have option one where a kid gives into peer pressure initially and they just take their mask off and then you know, maybe they get exposed to another kid and have to quarantine for 14 days or out of school. Or two, they try to hold strong and keep their mask on, and then the other kids make fun of them. I, I absolutely think it's going to be an issue. Russell, your so, thoughts? Yep. Yeah, so I think you, I think this conversation taps into a bigger issue. So I think that um, you're really addressing like what we call the culture of a school. And so you can take mask off, off the table and you can put religion. You can take mask off the table. You can put race, different race. You know, you can take mask off the table and think about LGBTQIA. You know, you can, you can put you can put that. So now we're actually talking about the school culture and what type of culture this school has and being intentional about if, 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 the, if it's optional. Some people can wear masks. Some people you know, don't wear masks. Some people have glasses. Some people have darker skin. Some people have lighter skin. So I think that that comes into a school culture. And a lot of the times, um, speaking from experience, like the school culture can almost, most of the time in my experience, override like what the parents are saying at home. And the kids could come in a positive school culture. You'd be surprised and they can just fit right in despite what's being said at home. So I think that that kind, those kinds of conversations, and if the kids are doing that, that taps into what's the bigger issue, what's the culture of that school, and how was that mistreatment allowed? All right, you just made me feel better. Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, seriously, I, it's, you know, it, because it, it is, we are putting so much on the educators. You know, I mean, just in this conversation, you know, they're, they're basically have to be, uh, you know, in addition to educators, and everything that come, comes along with that, you know, we're putting all of these responsibilities on them. And, you know, I, I think you're right. If, if there's a good foundational culture there, it's not going to be a thing, um, you know, and obviously there are always going to be some exceptions and outliers, but I, I, I think you're right. And it comes down to, you know, if we do believe that the schools and the, the people that work there have the best interests of our kids at heart, we've got to have faith in them to be able to, manage those things the best way they can and be there for assistance whenever it's needed. You know, that that's kind of the way I look at it. So we're coming up on an hour. Um, I, I'm going to try to wrap it up, but I wanted to do, first of all, is there any major issue that we didn't hit on with this? I, I think I went down my checklist. Is there something else about this that we should be talking about that we haven't? I think the only other point I would like to make is that I think the lack of leadership from the state has put an unfair burden on our local school boards. It is the role of school boards to set policy, right? There's only like three things in the school code that that's what school board directors are defined as being to, you know, responsible for. But in this case, we are in the first pandemic we've had to live through in this generation. No one knows what's going to happen next. We are all learning this together. And I do feel what you said in the beginning, the local school boards are being, you know, it's being punted to them unfairly, and they are dealing with all this vitriol and hate and anger. And it is time for our state legislators and our members of Congress and the State Board of Ed and the State Board of you know, Health to step up and really take some leadership. So that leads me into the kind of the last question is where what where are we six months from now? What do you th where do you think we are, you know, kind of overall in terms of 
Has the state stepped up at some point? Are the, you know, are our schools open? Are they closed? Where, where, where do you think we're heading? Lisa, you're first. Sorry, I had my mic off. Um, well, so six months, that's February. And uh, it, it's flu season. What we found last year, what the CDC found, was there were very few uh, serious cases of flu last year because of the masks that we were all wearing for COVID. So if we can get enough districts wearing masks, I think we're open, we're thriving, our children are doing well, they're sledding. Uh, hopefully we can ski for those of us who do that. You know, if we, we get that done in the districts that haven't done that, I think they get into a vicious cycle of closures and quarantines. And I think it'll be really a stark contrast. Russell, your thoughts? Six months, where are we at? So, Jesse, I don't see it as positive as Lisa sees. <laughs> and I hate to say it, like, um, and I, again, I'm thinking about elementary schools where no one is vaccinated. I mean, my kids love to hug and high five and all of that kind of stuff. And now we're getting ready to put them all back in the building. I do, and I, and I like, again, I'm 100% for five days a week, but I cannot see. It's kind of, uh, you know, the, the good thing is the adults have the option to be vaccinated, but I feel like we're headed back down the road um, to where, like, I, I don't see, I don't see, uh, like, I don't know if we're going to be back into a, uh, you know, some kind of virtual something um, I don't want to say full like closure of schools, but some semblance of what we've seen before. Um, I don't see any way of avoiding that, especially for my little ones. Dan, six months, where are we? Um, I think it's going to be a bit of a two prong story. Um, kind of like Dr. Patterson alluded to, vaccines are a huge issue. Thankfully, students five to 12, um, from what I'm seeing, they should have the opportunity to be vaccinated by October. So hopefully parents will be taking advantage of that. Um, yes, fingers crossed. And that we will be able to get those students a certain level of protection. I think that what we're really going to see in the more immediate future, um, like we've already started to see, is that student, or schools that don't mandate masks are, like Dr. Patterson said, they're going to be shutting down. They're going to be have, having mass quarantines. And I think what you're going to be seeing is the schools that are mandating masks, they are going to have students out. They're going to have some teachers out. But I think by and large, they're going to be able to continue in-person five-day-a-week learning um, and kind of get through this from an education standpoint relatively unscathed compared to the schools that are not mandating masks. Yeah. And just and hope. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Lisa. No, but for a future podcast, because I know you want to wrap this up, we have mm -hmm. to talk about this culture of people don't feel they can take off work and stay home when their kids are sick. Sending kids to school sick has been a problem forever. It's just so much more serious now. And I've actually said from the very beginning, we need isolation spaces. So if a kid comes into school with the sniffles, they need to be isolated immediately. And we need to work with local hospitals. We need to, you know, gymnasiums can be turned into isolation or, you know, nurses offices may not be big enough. But that in January and February, if we're going to keep schools open, is going to be absolutely required to have isolation spaces in public schools. Yeah, if we, if we do. They have that in the district where I work. They put those in place. They would call them like the um, the cares room or uh, uh, that's our term for. It. But it's a space where if they have the sniffles, they can be isolated, um, gently isolated or, um, you know, yes, yeah, so I, I, I definitely uh, agree with that. And Dan, to you know, to what you're you kind of predicted, I, I I agree with you, and I can only hope that as this, you know, as that this process plays out, if we're starting to see the data that shows that districts with mask mandates are you know are staying open and thriving as compared to ones that don't, that even despite a mandate from the state or wherever else, that those school boards will be willing to come back and say, you know what, we do need to go to a mask mandate. We do need to make these changes uh, and, and, you know, be willing to kind of make that about face, uh, you know, that pivot is needed. Um, and because I think that's ultimately going to be the thing that gets us all, uh, you know, paddling in the same direction. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank you all for this has been the one hour of most intellectual conversation I've had about masks in schools uh, in as long as I can remember. 
it's 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 wonderful to be talking with people that are all kind of of the same mindset but have different experiences um and clearly you're all very invested in and uh you know and very involved in this issue in your particular community so um and, and to the two elected school board members thank you or of the candidate and uh thank you very much for running school board is one of the most thankless but important positions out there um I, i've said that from all my time in politics um, you know, you've got to be nuts to run for school board unless you have some sort of weird alternative or ulterior motive. So uh, I thank you very much because I think this crisis has demonstrated more than ever how important it really is to have you know people that are really care and really analytically thoughtful and compassionate and, and really do have the best interest of the kids at heart. So thank you for that. Does anybody have anything they want to add? No, uh, thank you for having yep. having me, Jesse. And I look forward to uh, let's have some other conversations. There's so many other topics that we can talk about that are really interesting and that impact our children across the state. So hopefully we can come back and talk about some other things as well. Absolutely. So if you live in Bethel Park, uh, you're voting for Dan Grisbeck for school board. If you live in Pine Richland, you're voting for Dr. Russell Patterson and... If, if you, you live around you Lisa, call me. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're anywhere else, just call Lisa and bother her. So, again, know. thank you very much, Lisa Longbow, Dr. Russell Patterson, Dan Grisbeck. Thank you so much for your time. Um, do me a favor. Once I shut the, I shut us off, please keep your browser open long enough so it uploads all of the files so everything's synchronized. Great. All right. All right thank thank you very much, good. everybody. Thank it was you. a pleasure yeah, to you. meet you, both uh, yeah. Dr. Patterson and Dan, because I can't yeah. pronounce your last name properly. That's right. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice to Good meet luck. you.